First John chapter one, verses one through four. Today, people are certainly searching far and wide for a life of true satisfaction, true joy, true life as it is intended. Now, this is nothing new. A guy named Solomon, the third king of Israel, he discovered that relationships, women, wisdom, the sciences, beauty, the arts, all lacked the ability to give him a sense of true joy and true life. Now, another guy that we refer to as the rich young ruler, he discovered that he could have great possessions and yet still be lacking something. Another gal in the scriptures named Martha, she had a real knack for serving, but was missing one thing that Jesus said is necessary. We even read of a whole people group whose lust for leeks and garlic and food caused them to grumble against the Lord as they wandered through the wilderness, caused them all to die in the wilderness rather than go into the promised land because they thought that what they wanted, what was going to give them true life, was found in material comforts and things. So... It's no understatement to say that people today are searching far and wide for a life of true satisfaction. In fact, one of the anthems of our age from an old burnt out dude as he complains and says, I can't get no satisfaction. Today we have all the gadgets, the YouTube channels, magazines, counselors, apps, yet they still haven't found what they're looking for. It is only when we are in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ that we experience true satisfaction, true joy, true life as it is intended. Now, that's what the Apostle John wants for his readers, and that's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for us. And that's what we're going to see in this message today. Jot this down if you're a quick writer. Here's the main point. You probably can't jot all this down, so don't burden yourself when I start talking and you're like, oh, wait a minute. You could have, anytime you want the notes, you can get them. But, but here's what I think the main point that God has for us today in his word. God wants people to be in fellowship with him. It is only when we are in fellowship with God that we experience true satisfaction, true joy, and true life as it is intended. There are three things about this fellowship in the passage before us. Let's go ahead and read, and then I'll tell you what they are. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word, and I know that it does not return void. And so I look forward to this full joy being restored in some being experienced for the first time even as we go through this wonderful letter. Father in heaven, beyond the words of a man, may your Holy Spirit speak. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. There are three things that we should know about this fellowship. Number one, verses one through two, the center of fellowship is Jesus Christ. The center of fellowship. Our fellowship is centered on Christ. Number two, we will see an invitation to fellowship in verse three. And number four, then we will see the result of fellowship. Number one, the center of fellowship. Now, in verse three, John says that they have been declaring something. Do you see that there? That's the first time like a verb, the main verb of the passage shows up right there. He has been declaring something. He and the other apostles. You see that in verse 3. Now, in verses 1 and 2, he talks about what they have been declaring. The end of verse 1 tells us the subject of what they have been declaring, the word of life. 
Now, this is a title for Jesus. The word of life is a title for Jesus, and John and the apostles have been declaring him or proclaiming him. Now, in the first two verses, John says a few things about this word of life. He says, number one, that he is eternal, he, that which was from the beginning. Number two, they heard him, they saw him, they studied his life, and number five, they touched him. In other words, he's eternal, and he came in the flesh. John was an eyewitness to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, as Christians, we don't base our lives upon cunningly devised fables, as Peter put it. He said, Peter said this in chapter 2, uh, chapter 1, verse 16 of 2 Peter. Listen to what he says. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that's what John is saying here. The eternal God, the word of life, Jesus Christ, he came in the flesh and we hung out with him. We touched him. We hugged him. We heard him. We saw him. We made a diligent study of him. We examined his life. Now, the very fact that John is putting it like this is because it's amazing. What he is saying is amazing. Now, you may have been a Christian so long, and you may have these Western American ears, as we all have. We were born here, most of us, where we hear that God came in the flesh, and we go, yeah, God came in the flesh. Do you realize what's being said here? That the eternal God, the creator of all things, the genius behind design of everything, the one who created, who sustains, who spoke the cosmos into existence, that all functions perfectly like a clock. We can't even figure out how everything works. And, and we say, yeah, he came in the flesh. Yeah, yeah. The guys hung out with him. Yeah, sure, they, they touched him. God help our ears. Help our dull hearts if this doesn't make us excited. Amen. We base our lives on eyewitness testimonies. Now, maybe you're sitting here today and you reject Jesus Christ and you say, that's an adult fairy tale book. I heard that one from a guy before. I would have you know that what John is saying is that these are not fairy tales. I saw Jesus, we and the others, and we examined his life. We studied his life. And we write from the perspective of an eyewitness. That which was from the beginning, John's begin, he begins saying that. He says, I'm talking to you about something eternal that came into material existence. This would have been familiar language for John's readers. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, and the Word was with God, I'm sorry, and the Word was God. All of the W's are capitalized. The Word is another name for Jesus, the Logos. Familiar language to John's readers. Now, when we say something is eternal, people think they're clever and they'll be like, if God created everything, who created God? Well, you clearly have not read your Bible because the Bible presents a God that is eternal with no creator. He's eternal. So don't ever let anybody get you tripped up with that one. You know, that's, that's kind of like an eight-year-old question, right? Who created God? I remember, I think, when Leanne was asking questions like that. You know, <laughs> who created God? Late at night, if I remember, too. Yeah. Well, think about this. We live in time. Time is a created thing. There is a thing called eternity in which time does not exist. This thing that, a, you know, that John and these other apostles, they heard, seen with their eyes, looked upon, made a full study of, touched, literally handled, exists eternally and came into existence at a time and place. Now, let's go further. In Mary, not her, the virgin mother of Jesus, in her womb, the eternal God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, second person, he came into existence as a human. Now, he'd always existed, but he came into existence as a human inside of Mary. John says, we saw him. Now, 
We later on in chapter 2, verse 22, figure out that this is a statement against heresy in this book. There were those in the church that were saying that Jesus did not come in the flesh. He's saying Jesus did come in the flesh, rather. So far, we know he's eternal, divine. He came into time in a flesh body. If, I don't know if your mind's blown already. We could just stop here the rest of our lives and think about this the rest of our lives, and we could get fed well, just meditating on these truths. I don't know if you know that. He says, concerning the word of life, here John names the eternal being. This one, that one that is from the beginning is the word of life. In calling Jesus the word of life, John is saying a lot. The Jewish use of the term we talked about last time, they used to call the word the logos because the Jews believed that God perfectly revealed himself in his word. So they called the word the logos. The Greeks used this word. They wrote about it for, uh, you know, thousands, you know, hundreds of years and talked about uh, how you know, by the way, the, Bre the Greeks were brilliant. Their scientists were brilliant. Sometimes we think of people in, you know, eternity, you know, or not eternity, but ancient history. We think, oh, they must have been very primitive. They were brilliant. They observed the natural order. They observed the creation, the <clears throat> patterns that exist, and they realized there was a, an intelligence behind this. Um, and they called that the logos. And so when John says, that Jesus is the Logos, he's saying a lot. He's saying, you Jews, uh, let me tell you, I know him. He came into existence. I touched him. I hung out with him. You Greeks that believe that there's this divine, you know, master intelligence, great architect of the universe behind everything, you're right. And he came into existence, and we hung out with him. We touched him. We spent time with him. That's what John is saying. This life, Jesus says in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way, the truth. Huh, just kidding. <laughs> let's just worship again. Okay, let's worship the Lord. No one comes to the Father except through him. John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, say it with me, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the sort of life that we're talking about right there. Jesus is the Logos of Zoe. He is the Logos. He's the direct language, representation, exact exact communication of God manifests in the flesh, and he has life. He is life. Now, this is what he brings to spiritually dead people, like you and me, that were born spiritually dead, who needed to be born again. And when we get born again, we partake of the same life. Do you know that you have that life here today? We're not talking about bios, like animals and plants, or probiotics, which I've been taking. So if you hear my stomach through this microphone, that's why. <laughs> 20 billion. <laughs> Jesus is eternal life. It's far beyond bios. It's far beyond biological life. It's the essence or the spark even behind bios. It's the very life of God himself, the Greek word zoe. John 10.10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. They might have it abundantly. I came so spiritually dead people could be made spiritually alive. Amen. The word of life is none other than the eternal creative source of all things visible and invisible. He is the one through whom all things were made. He's the one who, with the Spirit of God, fashioned the heavens and the earth, made light shine in the darkness, and stepped into creation when the word became flesh. This is Jesus. Verse 2 says, and that life was manifested. Now, how could this all, how could we see this? Well, it was because he was manifested. To manifest, or another version puts it, he appeared. Manifesting is something that always ex existed. Jesus Christ always existed. He's eternal. And then he was manifest. He was like, this Bible is existing now it's made manifest. That's really the idea there. John is saying that all this became visible and we saw him. Eternal life made visible in the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, the, the eternal life, that eternal life which was with the Father. Now this is interesting. He's talking about the pre-existent, the pre-incarnate Christ. 
the pre-incarnate Christ. He always existed in eternity with Father and with the Father in the Trinity. They had fellowship with one another for eternity. Some believe that's why it says, let us make man in our image. I know it's debated, but the traditional you know, view of that is that God is talking about his relationship with the Trinity at that point. We also see the Holy Spirit involved in creation. The Spirit hovered over and essentially brooding over the elements of creation, brought them into existence. Jesus is not a created being. He is eternal. He is the second person of the Trinity. In the beginning, the Word uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.18 says, The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. Talking about how Jesus, the eternal God, has always been with the Father. By the way, it's interesting that Jesus um, revealed God to people as a Father. Now, that was radical in those days, to call God your Father. And Jesus, you remember in the Lord's Prayer? How should we pray? Yeah, he says, call him your father, our father who art in heaven. Wow, you mean God's my dad? I'm glad he's not like my dad. <laughs> I've only learned what a good father is by studying the word of God and by looking at Jesus Christ. Because you remember when Jesus said this? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Now, that's why I love to read the word so much. I want to get to know more about this God, God before time that came in the flesh, that he came to man to be known. Isn't that something? God wants to be known by you, by me. I don't think there's anything more exciting than thinking about this. God wants to be known. He wants you to know him. So, how, so he comes in the, in the form of a human so he can relate with us. Number one, the center of fellowship is Jesus Christ himself. Now, an invitation to fellowship. Look at verse 3, please. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. So he takes off on what he's been talking about. That's what, that which we have seen and heard. Now he says, we declare to you. There's that verb. We declare. The main action of verses uh, 1 through 4 is John talking about what he's been declaring with the others. John essentially says this eternal life, Jesus Christ, the eternal God that came in the flesh, we proclaim him to you. We preach Christ and him crucified, Paul would have said, which is similar. In John's case and that of the apostles, the natural response to coming into contact with the word of life is that they declared him to others. Why would he do that? Look, it goes on there, verse 3. That you also may have fellowship with us. Now, here John gives his reasoning for declaring Christ to others. This is our purpose as Christians, is to declare Jesus Christ to others so that other people can come into fellowship with us and our fellowship is with God. This is what we do as Christians. When somebody struggles with a purposeless, seeming, meaningless life, well, this ranks up there as a thing of great importance that God has called you to proclaim Jesus so that others can enter into fellowship with him. The motive behind our evangelism, also the teaching, the word to the believers is fellowship. Christianity is not a solo activity so much. There may be periods of time when people need to be isolated. There may be specific callings, but by and large, Christianity is a community thing. Fellowship among other people among believers with God. And look what he says going on. He says, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you a little bit of background. There were those in John's day that were saying, No, in fact, we have fellowship 
with God, and you guys probably don't. And so this is, when you do what's called mirror reading, sometimes to figure out the situation of a letter, we need to do mirror reading. We need to read what's being said and then kind of use our sanctified imagination to kind of deductive reasoning to see what is he speaking against. But we find out in this letter that there were those that were saying they had fellowship. And then many times throughout the letter, John will essentially call them liars. And so he's trying to straighten out this problem of false teaching uh, in the church. And this is part of that right there. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How can a sinful man or a woman come into fellowship with a holy God? Well, when we place our faith in Jesus, his righteousness is imputed to us. We get his perfect record applied to our life. You see, sin separates us humans from God. And so to say that humans could have fellowship, could be in a relationship with God is, how could that happen? It happens because when we place our faith in Christ, that his perfect record of righteousness is given to us. We take his perfect record of obedience to God's law. He always obeyed. And also at the cross, what he did 2,000 some years ago at the cross is applied to our account. That's how we can come into fellowship with God. Again, I think Western ears just don't appreciate how radical it is to say that you can have a relationship with God. As you are rightly related to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you're in fellowship with him, and then God wants to use you then to bring other people into fellowship with you. And this is typically how it works, right? And then they will be brought into fellowship with God. See, as a Christian, there's a really powerful ministry. It's called the ministry of being friendly. You know? Some of you say, I don't know what my gifts are. Well, let me tell you, if you're friendly, that's a huge gift. I know some Christians that are not friendly. They look like they just bit three lemons. Stop it. If you're a friendly person, that's a good ministry. I'm serious. If you like to open your house to people, if you like to hold the door for people at the store, if you're not just too busy to do that, if you like to engage people in conversation at a restaurant, if you like to, you know, make friends with people, that's a huge ministry. Because when people are brought into fellowship with you and friendship with you, and you're in fellowship with God, eventually that fellowship with God is going to start affecting their lives. I think that's kind of what John's getting at here. Uh, we declare the word of life to you, Jesus Christ, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship truly is with God and with Jesus Christ. This word fellowship, it's kind of interesting. What does it mean to have fellowship with God and one of another? This is one of the most important concepts in John's letter here. Now, fellowship is not simply social interaction. Do you remember when you grew up in like an old school kind of church where they had fellowship like only in one room, I thought? Because it was the fellowship hall. That's where you go for fellowship. Oh, wait a minute. Here, let's go in here. Oh, now we're having fellowship. You know, uh, it happens in the fellowship hall. No, it only doesn't happen in the fellowship hall. Let me tell you this. You could be having a conversation or social interaction with somebody and it's not fellowship. You could even be in a church having a potluck, sitting across the table talking with somebody the whole time, and it, it, you, know, you may not have fellowship. Fellowship, the Greek word is the word koinon koinonia. koinonia. Comes from a root word meaning common. Acts 2.44 has a good idea of it. It says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, there's really no English word that captures the meaning. It is an incredible word. The ancient Greek, um, actually, in ancient Greek, it was commonly used of the marriage relationship, the marriage relationship, koinonia, to describe that bond, that, that sort of relationship that's just on a whole different level. Now, the word speaks of sharing, a communion, a common bond, common personal life. It speaks of a living, breathing, sharing, loving relationship with another person. The fellowship John wants them to have with God is an incredibly close relationship of partnership, giving and receiving, partaking in common life, common goal with God along with the apostles and others. He's not only promoting harmony, and harmony, unity, friendship, but so much more. Sharing in a common life, common resources, and common 
work together. Again, this is where our Western ears, we need help. This statement is mind-blowing that God wants you to engage in this sort of a relationship with him. It's really what the uh, saints' communion is talking about in the Apostles' Creed. We sing that song. I believe in the saints' communion. Now, this is possible because Jesus is living. He's risen. He is the eternal God, omnipresent, and desires a vital, living, loving relationship with people. Now, it is important that it's, it's kind of tragic, actually, that people will settle for so much less. Isn't that? That some people will settle for a dead religious formalism. They will just go through the motions. I'll wake up. I'll show up at that building. I'll listen to that guy talk. I'll go home. I won't pick up my Bible until next week. I won't really think about Christ. I'll try to live life on my own and my own resources. And they don't realize that God wants to have this vital connection with them, this life-giving relationship. Some think of Christianity as just adding a little bit of Jesus into the mix of their lives. In fact, a lot of people in this country today are sort of pagan in their approach to Christianity where they think of Jesus really, if you really examine him, he's kind of just no more than a lucky rabbit's foot. Well, I wear a cross and I say I know Jesus because I'm really just kind of worried about heaven, but I think I got it figured out here. I mean, I claim to know Christ. Do you have a relationship with him? Now, it should be noted that the close experience, this experience of close fellowship with God is not an automatic thing for the Christian. Now, in one sense, if you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation in him alone and not in your own works, Jesus of Nazareth died on the cross, buried, resurrected three days. In a sense, now you have fellowship. You're, you're part of the body of Christ if you trust in Christ, if you're a Christian. But the close experience, the experience of this close koinonia See, I believe John's writing to believers that have been, for whatever reason, starting to lose this close sense of this fellowship. The close fellowship with God is not an automatic thing for a Christian. Simply going to church, listen to a sermon does not mean somebody's in fellowship. Merely having a head full of Bible knowledge does not mean somebody is in fellowship. Now, there are some things that cause believers to be out of fellowship with God. The first one that comes to mind would be unconfessed sin. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 7 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. Unconfessed sin is a reason that fellowship is broken between you and your father between me and my father. Another one would be unforgiveness. Remember Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15? Listen to this. Jesus says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I think he's talking about fellowship there in the sense it's like a um, pretty serious thing. How about a lack of love? 1 John 4, 20 through 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he's not seen? I mean, some things that destroy fellowship, that damage fellowship. How about worldliness? James 4, 4 says, adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. Idolatry, placing anything higher on your priorities in life than Jesus Christ. Anything that comes before him is an idol. It's been rightly said, I think, that the human heart is an idol factory. I want to make an idol out of everything. I want everything to deliver everything that I think I need, and I want to put that before Jesus every day. I don't know if you've examined yourself and noticed that. The human heart being an idol factory. Anything that comes before our commitment and our devotion and our love to Jesus Christ is an idol. And we know the way that this letter ends. 1 John 5, 21 says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. These are the things that could damage fellowship. What about being spiritually lukewarm? Because you're not hot or cold, I spit you out. Think of marriage for a second as an illustration, okay? And I, and I think this is fitting. 
Someone can be married on paper, yet fail to have a living, breathing, sharing, loving relationship with their spouse. Certainly can. Essentially, you know, if you're not engaged in your marriage, if you're not doing the work of being a God-honoring spouse, your marriage is not going to be what God desires. Now, the same is true in our fellowship with Jesus. It's interesting that after being married for a couple of years, isn't it, that people start to become like one another. They start to look like one another. No, they don't. You yeah, haven't been married long enough for that, you know. Surely we start to look like one another, become like one another when we're in close fellowship with one another. If we're in close fellowship with Jesus Christ, we're becoming more and more like him as well. This is one of the signs of fellowship. If you want to ask yourself today, are you in fellowship with the Lord? Ask yourself this simple question. Am I becoming more like Jesus the longer I live? Because that's what he wants for you. He doesn't want some academic only head knowledge, religious checking the boxes off, dead formalism. That's not what he wants. Some manipulative put money in the box so he will bless me sort of soda machine relationship. That's not what he wants. He wants a living, breathing, vital, life-giving, common, sharing, real relationship with you. And he wants it so bad he paid for it at such a great cost. The center of fellowship is Jesus Christ, and we've seen John's invitation to fellowship. Finally, here's the result of this fellowship. He says, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Amen. Here's the second reason given for writing. First of all, the fellowship. And it comes now as the result of being in fellowship with God. You know, joy, when you aim for joy... You don't get it. But when you aim for a relationship with Jesus Christ, it comes as the byproduct. Looking for love in all the wrong places, right? I mean, there's people who are looking for joy in all the wrong places. I'll tell you what, John has the heart of the pastor here. He wants to see his people walk in joy. And I will tell you that nothing grieves a Christian or a pastor more than when he sees a group of people that are not walking in joy when they can be, when they are appropriating Christ into their life and sharing in the life of Christ that can just overflow their life with abundance. And to watch people settle for something less than that is heart-wrenching. Now, people in this world are on the constant pursuit of happiness. Now, the thing about happiness is it may or may not happen. I used to live in Minneapolis area, and uh, when I did, <laughs> I used to, <laughs> during high school, I <laughs> no, uh, used to run around with these guys, and we were always doing crazy stuff, and we were always pursuing happiness. And, you know, I remember one night, we were, you know, happy, um, you know, and we were out running, and we thought it would be really fun and give us a lot of happiness to climb this massive tower. It's like midnight, and there's this massive tower at a softball diamond with the lights on the top, and you think, well, you know, that's... That's not that far. Well, four of us get on the ladder at the same time. And uh, the higher we get, you know, we're laughing, having a good time, almost, you know how we almost laugh so hard where it's like, I can't even hold on to this thing, you know, like, ah. And uh, we, you begin to notice the wind is blowing. And all of this tower looked like it wasn't moving. This thing's moving, swaying. And you wonder, is it rated for four people? Well, the happiness soon turns uh, to terror when the guy that went first, Jack, he's like frozen. Like, I can't move. <laughs> and he's crying. <laughs> <laughs> Happy one moment. Terrified the next. This is how feelings work. Now, if you base your life on feelings, you will be a yo-yo. 
You won't have joy. That's not what joy is. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness at the bottom of the tower by the time you got to the top and had to leave Jack there. I don't even know what happened. We left him. Uh, not a proud moment. Um, I think he got down. I <laughs> saw him again. <laughs> you know, eventually. <laughs> Poor Jack. He wanted to be a street magician. That was his goal in life. He wanted to move to Europe and be a street magician. <laughs> Get yourself down off that tower, bro. He says, look, I, I want your joy to be complete. I want your joy to be full. I want you to be a person of joy. Now, this is, this is a privilege that a Christian has. See, happiness has to do with happenings may or may not happen. Comes and goes like the wind. It's up and down. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be happy. It's a very good thing to be happy. God created happiness. But you don't live for happiness. Now, joy is something different. You could be in a season of sorrow and yet still have joy. In fact, I experienced it as I watched my grandmother take her last breaths as she began to get sweaty. And I knew that something was going to happen soon. And I looked over at my wife and I said, this is it, man, this is it. And I lifted her up by the back and I gave her over to Jesus. I knew at that moment that my grandmother was going with Jesus. And there was fellowship in that room. There was koinonia in that room. And although my heart was breaking because this is the only woman that ever treated me like a mother in my life, I had joy because I knew where she was going. And I knew he was in the room. And I knew that I'll see her soon. Now, you can have joy even in the season of sorrow. In fact, Spurgeon said the deathbed is the best bed for the Christian. Hmm. And this is what he wants. He wants your joy to be full. It is a deep sense of contentment, optimism, gladness, and peace, not based on circumstances, but rather on God. Do you know the heart-shaped, the God-shaped hole that you have in your heart? There are people making money off of you today as you try to buy things to fill it. Nothing is going to fill it except for a vital, real relationship with God himself. And that's why John's writing. I'm writing so your joy will be full. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. John says, Jesus says in John 15, until now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full, John 16. Now, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves in the high priestly prayer, John 17. Romans 14, 17, here's one, we'll just go to an epistle. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking and climbing towers, but, no, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. To some people, it seems like almost no big deal that they've lost their joy. Again, Spurgeon says that if you've lost your joy, I would pray that you would count that as a very big deal. Some people almost accept it as normal, as they say, I was really on fire for the Lord at some point in my life, but you know, I'm just, I'm kind of not like that anymore. No, it doesn't really have the same thing. To the false teachers in John's day, this very basic gospel that Christ died to save sinners, that would seem primitive. you believe that stuff? And they would venture away then from the very basic, simple, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is an, this is an offer for you today to return to the simplicity of your faith, to trust in Christ, to walk away from that which that has been seeking to rob you, to leave behind the things that you've been trying to fit into the God-shaped hole that's only made for him. This is the time for that. John writes so that your joy may be full. That is his desire for his readers. and That's God's desire for you today. If you've never entered into this fellowship with God, you can do so so simply. It comes by confessing your sin, that you've lied, cheated, stolen, you've not lived up to the glory of God, you've broken his laws and commands just like every other human that has ever lived since the Garden of Eden till now, and acknowledging that before him. His Holy Spirit has bear witness in your life, he's bore witness in your life, he's convicted you that you need a savior. And today you're done trying to cover that up, you're done trying to run from that and you want to come into fellowship with the Lord and you do that first of all by acknowledging your sin before him. Then what you do is you believe that God so loved the world that he sent his son to die on a cross in the place of sinners to pay the penalty of sin but also to live the life they could never live 
so that through faith in him, you would receive his perfect record and the payment for your sins. And God the Father will declare you righteous, restoring that fellowship between you and your heavenly Father. You can do that now. Acknowledge, believe, and then confess the Lord Jesus. Trust your life into his hands. Now, if you have lost your joy today and you want it back, you need a spiritual work of the Lord in your heart. And so I want to pray today. I want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch hearts here, that you would touch maybe somebody, maybe multiple people today, Lord, that are needing your work in their lives. It's beyond anything a pastor can do, a friend. It's beyond anything anybody can do. You need Jesus to do this. You need his spirit to do this in your heart. Lord, I know there are those here today calling out to you. Father, I want to be engaged again. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And that is my prayer today, that your joy would be full. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your mighty work here today. And we trust you. And we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for that abundant life that flows from you to us and out from us. Lord, may you use us Lord, we're willing to bring others into this fellowship. And we thank you for the fellowship we have in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Let's go ahead.